I talk a lot about why game masters should never railroad their players. And a lot of game masters will respond by saying, Oh yeah, I don't want to railroad my players, but... But. There are a lot of justifications or rationalizations that follow the but. And most of us know that role-playing games aren't really designed for linear, predetermined plot. But since the vast majority of the media we consume is purely linear, even most of the quote-unquote interactive stuff, these linear creative instincts get buried pretty deep in us. One of the most common versions of the but I hear is, but I don't want them to kill my bad guy. The justifications for this vary from a predetermined finale that's being ruined to the more seductive version of convincing yourself that your players just won't be satisfied if the bad guy is prematurely knocked off. These instincts aren't necessarily wrong. Pulp fiction is filled with scenes where the heroes impotently watch the bad guys escape, building the sense of rivalry between them and baiting our appetite for the inevitable showdown at the end of the story. It's an effective trope. But I don't think railroading is the only way to achieve that trope at the gaming table. Nor do I think it's the most effective. When you push your thumb onto the scales of fate in order to predetermine the outcome of your game, you deflate the value of that outcome. Worse yet, if you do it poorly, or simply do it often enough, the anger and frustration of your players will stop being focused on the NPC villain, and it will start focusing on you. So if railroading isn't the answer, how do we create memorable villains in our role-playing games? What I recommend is a three-pronged approach. First, build tension between the PCs and the villain without using direct confrontation between them. Give the bad guy minions. Have the bad guy do horrible things off-screen to the people, places, and organizations that the PCs care about. Oh, social interactions in situations where the PCs won't be able to simply shoot them in the head without serious consequences can also work well to build a personal relationship between them, as do taunting communiques and phone calls. Second, when you're prepping your scenarios, include lots of bad guys. You're probably doing this anyway, so the real key here is to simply refrain from pre-investing one of these guys as the big villain. Basically, don't get attached to any of your antagonists. Assume that the first time they're in a position where the PCs might kill them, that the PCs will definitely kill them. This attitude will also help you to break any railroading habits you might still be secretly harboring. Third, remember that people in the real world usually don't fight to the death. Have your bad guys run away. And not just your big villain, since you won't have one of those anyway, right? Unless their back is truly to the wall, most of the people your PCs fight should try to escape once a fight turns against them. Uh, most of them will probably still end up with a bullet in the back of their heads, but some of them will manage to escape. The ones that escape? Those are your memorable villains. Those are your major antagonists. This is the crucial inversion. Instead of figuring out who your major bad guy is and then predetermining that they will escape to wreak their vengeance, What's happening here is that the guy who escapes to wreak their vengeance becomes the major bad guy. Consider the movie Die Hard for a moment. As written, this film is a great example of our first principle. The antagonism between John McClane and Hans Gruber is established almost entirely without any direct interaction between the two of them. Uh, Gruber takes McClane's wife hostage. They talk to each other through telecommunication devices. Uh, Gruber sends his thugs to fight McClane elsewhere in the building far from him. The exception to this is the scene where Gruber pretends to be one of the hostages. This is actually a really clever device that heightens the conflict between McLean and Gruber by allowing them to directly interact with each other. But if this was a game table, what would happen if the PCs saw through Gruber's bluff and put a bullet through his forehead right then and there? Well, it doesn't matter. Remember our second principle? lots of bad guys. So now Die Hard becomes the story of the hot-headed Carl Vresky taking control of Gruber's delicate operation and blowing it up in a mad pursuit for vengeance. And maybe he starts killing hostages and becomes the most memorable villain of the campaign when he throws McLean's wife off the top of Nakatomi Plaza. Okay, okay, so cycling through the org chart of Villains Incorporated works when you're facing a team of bad guys. But what if the PCs really are just facing off against a single nemesis? 
Well, first off, remember that not every challenge needs to be of epic proportions. Sometimes you run into some goblins in the woods, and you kill them, and you move on. You don't need every goblin to murder the priestess's cousin or become the sworn blood enemy of the paladin, after all. Second, even the most memorable villains from fiction are often part of Villains Incorporated, even when that isn't immediately obvious. For example, consider Dracula. Wouldn't it be really unsatisfying if Jonathan Harker sneaked into Dracula's tomb at the beginning of the book and staked him to the heart before he ever went to England? I mean, this is THE Dracula, right? Remember, though, that Dracula is only THE Dracula, because that didn't happen at the hypothetical gaming table we're talking about. If we were running this as an actual scenario, then we wouldn't know that he's supposed to become obsessed with Harker's wife and kill Mina's best friend in pursuit of her. We would discover that during play. So let's pretend that play had gone a different way. Harker stakes Dracula and heads back to England, satisfied that he's destroyed an ancient evil. It's a beautiful, happy ending. Until the brides of Dracula pursue him to England seeking their bloody vengeance. Dracula? Schmacula. He was just the appetizer. He was just the way that we set up the true villainesses of our campaign. Uh, fake examples like this from other forms of media can be useful due to the common understanding we have of the source material. You know Die Hard. You know Dracula. But they can also be misleading because the official version of events from the original media lends a patina of canonicity that shouldn't be true of actual tabletop scenarios. So let me offer a handful of examples from In the Shadow of the Spire, my third edition D&D campaign set in Monty Cook's Tolis. Cillian was a cult leader. Using our first principle, I built her up in a variety of ways. Her name was referenced in early foreshadowing, the PCs tangled with her thugs and were targeted for retaliation by her organization. She was also incorporated into the background of a new PC, becoming responsible for murdering the PC's family and destroying their village. Eventually, the PCs managed to track down her lair. They snuck in, found her digging through a box of archaeological artifacts, rolled a critical hit, and put an arrow through the back of her skull. She literally never even got a chance to look them in the face. My players? They gleefully tell this story at every opportunity. They love it. It's one of their favorite moments from the entire campaign. Why did it work? Because when you heavily invest a villain through foreshadowing, the payoff of defeating them is massively satisfying. Now, it can be argued that this sort of thing might not work well in other media, although consider that Luke's physical confrontation with the Emperor in Return of the Jedi, after building it up over three films, lasts almost no time at all. But in a role-playing game, the audience is synonymous with the protagonist. Your players don't want to be handed their quarry on a plate, but a quick kill shot isn't a gimme. It's a reward for all the work that got them to the point where they could take the shot. Here's another example from the opposite end of the spectrum. Arveth was a mook. She was captured by the PCs, questioned by Teeth and Mamiwan, and then cut loose. When Elestra, another PC, tried to sneak back and slit Arveth's throat to stop her from warning the other cultists, Teeth and Mamiwan stopped her. But then the cultists caught up with Arveth. Believing that she had betrayed them to the PCs, they tortured her and even cut out her eye. Eventually, they concluded, however, that Arveth was still loyal to their cause, and they gave her a team of assassins and sent her to kill Teeth and Mamiwan. This was our second principle. Use lots of bad guys and develop the ones who survive. In some other campaign, Arveth could have easily been cut down randomly during combat and completely forgotten about by the next session. In this campaign, however, she targeted Teeth and Mommy One when she was alone. Arveth nearly succeeded in her assassination attempt before the rest of the party showed up. While the rest of her team held the party at bay, Arveth managed to escape, barely evading Teeth and Mommy One's angry pursuit. This was our third principle. When they're losing a fight, have your bad guys run away. At this point, things transition to the first principle. Arveth used a magical artifact to send horrible nightmares to Teeth and Mommy One, often featuring Arveth cutting out Teeth and Mommy One's eye. She issued threats to Teeth and Mommy One's friends. She placed a bounty on Teeth and Mommy One's head. Teeth and Mommy One responded, hiring spies to hunt down Arveth and leaving Arveth messages on the bodies of cultists she killed along the way. The PCs would eventually fight Arveth again. 
This time, Arveth was teamed up with a Medusa, who turned two of the party members to stone. Arveth carved an eye out of each of the statues before making her escape once again. By this point, of course, the PCs were absolutely furious. Teeth and Mamiwan in particular had a rage which burned so white-hot that her alignment actually shifted. She had shown this bitch mercy, and she was repaid with endless torment. I don't think I've ever seen such intense hatred focused towards an NPC before. It reshaped the entire course of the campaign. Arveth was a mook no more. When Arveth finally died, the cheers of the players rocked the house. They literally took her miniature as a trophy so that it could never be used in the game again. These are the villains that will be remembered forever by your players. And by you. Good gaming. This is Justin Alexander, and I hope to see you at the table.